Hello everybody and welcome to the No BS Virtual Book Club's live video series once again and joining me this week to share the stories behind the 10 books which influenced her the most on her spiritual journey is holistic therapist, healer, meditation teacher and audiobook author Nicola Harold. And Nicola has trained in hypnotherapy and psychotherapy and she specialises in, wait for it, female empowerment and conscious parenting, two things that are badly, badly needed today. Her guided meditations have been played more than three and a half million times and her biggest passion is teaching on the subject of goddess spirituality and the spiritual gifts of the menstrual cycle. Um, Nicola Howard, welcome. It's good Hello. to have you with us. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you for having me. Thank you for joining us, Nicola. And let's kick off by asking, what was it like for you having to compile 10 books out of probably many that you've read? Yeah, it was actually so much fun. And it was a really reflective experience because when you read a lot, where do I start? Where do I start? <laughs> How do I choose 10? So I found the way I did it was by looking back to the beginning of my journey. So actually, when I wrote the list, I started um, back when I was 14, which was sort of the, the beginning of my spiritual journey, and taking my way through. And it was amazing to see how I've grown through these books and how as time went on my interest changed and one book led me to another and the work became deeper but it was amazing to look back and see the books that have really stood out out of all of the amazing books that I've read and that helped me so much you know these were the books that really I mean they're life-changing and actually created such a foundation um, for me to work from as well as, as a healer, as a therapist. So it was so much fun, really, really was. Did you list them in the order that you read, you know, they came into your life? I did, yeah, you I did. found that was the easiest mm. way. Yeah. I sort of look back on my journey and okay, well, where did I start and what happened next? So yeah, it was, um, yeah, that's the way, <laughs> that's the way it came out. And I could see from the list, you know, how, how that did change in the books change and held different meanings for me yes. and so yeah it was it was brilliant yeah really someone fun. said a few weeks ago that it was like having a life review you know really before was. you die <laughs> yeah. You die. <laughs> yeah it really, really was yeah. and actually the timing of writing the list as well I felt that I was coming to uh, kind of transitioning into another chapter of life you know I feel like we live in cycles and it yes. felt that um, I think at the time, I think I just moved to Portugal, actually, when I wrote that list and, you know, just got married, moved to Portugal. So there was it was a big change and it was really lovely because it was like looking back on from where I started to where I was. And then this feeling of a, a new chapter was, was beginning. So the timing of it was really lovely as well. Good. I'm glad, I, you know, I'm so glad that you enjoyed it. And I'm yeah, glad really. that everybody does because then I don't feel so bad yeah. to do it. Because <laughs> it, can, it can be quite a task. I mean, some people said, oh, my God, I've got to read every book again to make sure. <laughs> exactly. I did think, OK, even now, because it was quite a while ago that I wrote the, you know, I wrote the list for you. I thought, well, I need to just triple check, you know, what books I put on and to familiarise myself with with them again and, and think back. So that's been really nice as well, actually, over the last week, just having a little look at the list and, um, yeah, just review, going back over it again. Yeah, Very good. Well, you, you started really young, didn't you? And you were really forced to start because you yeah. had... Um, you had an illness that kept you in bed for a long time. Yeah, yeah. I had ME, chronic fatigue syndrome, when I was 12. So it was my first year of secondary school and uh, developed glandular fever. Didn't know at the time that it was glandular fever. So I was you know, trying to go back to school. The doctor was dishing out you know, antibiotics uh, and I, I just crashed. So when I was, you know, not long term 13, everything just crashed and I just experienced deep, deep burnout uh, until really, I didn't really make a full recovery until it's probably my 22nd birthday when I thought, well, this is the first birthday I'm going into this year, 
you know, illness, illness free, but it was even at the time when it was really hard and, you know, I left school. So I completely missed school. I had a home shooter who would come in, but I mean, I was so ill. I wasn't really taking on much information, um, but it was even then I always explain it and feel it is it was the wisdom there was a wisdom in me so even though I was only 14 when I read my first book that's on the list there was a deeper wisdom in me that knew it was happening for a reason so even though I wanted to get better I knew that the journey from illness to being recovered was meaningful and that mm. I would then use all of that wisdom I knew I was destined to be some some kind of healer even then so so yeah I was forced into it but I'm so grateful that I was at a young age because I'd have been down yeah. a completely completely yeah. different path than yeah. the one I'm on now so how did the first book, which is Louise Hayes, You Can Heal Your Life, yeah. come into your life. Who gave that book to you? I can't even remember. It's actually funny because a few of these books on my list, I can't remember the moment where I actually bought it or I think I, I definitely bought it. Nobody gave it to me. I think it must have been in the bookshop or online. I must have seen something of, about it. Um, and I was because I, you know, I've been told by doctors, you know, you'll never make a full recovery. You'll always have a, you'll always have to be careful. And I refuse to believe that. Thank goodness, because if you know that's powerful, being told that you're never actually going to be well again. There's the suggestion. Is, is, yeah, yeah. I'm a hypnotherapist, so I understand <laughs> what that does to you. Yeah. So yeah. I refuse to believe that. I've got quite a. <laughs> quite a strong will so if I put my mind to something and I'm passionate about it I'll give it everything I've got so I cannot remember how I came across that book but it was the book that completely not only transformed um you know uh, how I was it changed everything I knew the belief systems uh, that I was living from this book it felt like I was remembering information that I knew deep down, <clears throat> yeah. but couldn't verbalize at the time because I was, you know, you just go to school and you're told a certain thing. You go to the doctor and they're like, well, we can't do anything, but put you on this medication and you don't want it. So it's like, well, what do you do from there? So this book, which I'm so grateful for, and I'm sure it's a favorite of, you know, many uh, many people in this world because mm. it's just so ahead of its time and it was incredible and I could just relate I could just relate to it so much so everything from there on um changed and transformed because it put me it changed changed where I was going it wasn't suddenly this dead end of well you know I want to get better but what do I do or you know I knew I was burnt out um but reading the book and actually understanding the effect of how you know my perfectionist tendencies and the pressure I was putting on myself and how that was really having a detrimental effect on my health like so severely that my body was like enough mm. you're not taking any more so boom it just crashed and having someone say you can get better and actually this is how this is how yes. you do it yeah was powerful for me then at that young age and it's still a book now that I will recommend time and time and time again to to clients to friends anybody because it's just that whole world of metaphysical healing it's just um you know thankfully becoming more and more popular as well because yeah. it's so needed it's it's a book that I mean as you say it changes lives because I think for many people it's probably the first time that they realize that they have the power within yes, them. Exactly. Which is amazing and scary for some people as well, yeah. because suddenly the responsibility, I talk to clients about this and it's, it's that responsibility, you know, they come to see me, but it, it's their response. It's their responsibility. And it's, I mean, that's an incredible thing when you realize that, but it's also a scary thing because we're so used to being programmed from a very young age to believe, to look to others, to look yeah. to the teacher at school, look to the doctor to fix us. When we realize that there's so much we can do with the help, of course, of amazing guides and amazing teachers and books, but wow, that's, 
it just unlocked something yeah. in me that I felt so passionate about as well. I just, I just loved it. Loved that nitty gritty, let's get down to it and get down to the source of, yeah. you know, why I'm not well and then how I can, you know, get better. Mm. Yeah. And it's good that you found it so young. Yeah. I'm so thankful for that because yeah. the path that I'd have been on, I'd have crashed at some point. I'm just glad I crashed young so that I could completely change the course yeah. of, you know, my life going forward. So I'm so grateful for that. So grateful. So book number two, Let Love Find You, Seven yeah. Steps to Open Your Heart to Love by John Selby. Yeah, I loved this book. And it's really funny because I've, again, I can't remember how I came across it. <laughs> um, it found me. But um, I've never to this day seen um, anybody else talk about talk about this book. And what I loved about this book, it was about, well, actually, what probably, you know, drew me into the book, I always knew I wanted to get married, I wanted to be in that loving relationship. So I think what was I 19 or something when I read that book. And so even then, you know, I was kind of wise beyond my years. And I knew I just knew inside of me, I didn't need that really long, um, you know, decade of, of dating and different relationships. I just knew in myself, I knew what I wanted, the kind of relationship I wanted to be in. And that book really encourages you to heal yourself and be really mindful of what you're looking for in a relationship. So rather than looking for someone to fix you, it's about healing yourself and being in a really good place so that when you find that person that you resonate with, that person that you're supposed to be with, you come into that in um, just a more expansive energy with more to give, more love to share. And actually I had a bit of an epiphany when I was looking over the list um, of these books, I remembered reading this book at the time. So I met my now husband when I was 22. So I met him three years after reading this book. But I remembered at the time when I was 19, around that time of reading this book, Part of the book is uh, meditation where you you feel that energy in your heart and you project it out and imagine that energy, you know, expanding outwards and touching the energy of that, that soul, that soul that you're supposed to be with. So I used to do that and I could really feel that. And it was around that time that um, I... So my husband, Glenn, is a hypnotherapist. I know you've interviewed him and his mm. 10 books. But at that time again, I think I was in a bookstore and I was at the counter buying a book. It'd be funny if it was this one that I'm talking about. I can't remember which one it was, but behind the counter were displayed CDs of Glenn Harold's <laughs> uh, you know, series of, of meditation, self-hypnosis. And there was one called Manifest Your Goals and Dreams. And I said to my mum at the time, something's telling me to buy that CD. So I did. And I didn't know I was going to meet the author three years later and end up marrying him and having children. So even though I didn't meet him at that time, clearly, you know, there's a, it's divine timing, is it? You need to meet yeah. at the right time. Yeah. But I, I thought, wow, I wonder if the energy and the meditations that I was doing at the time were it guiding me even then, because if it was actually buying that CD and understanding his work that then at 22, when I came across him, I knew who he was because I'd had the CD. So all these little things that happen, even years prior, the little stepping stones, it just, yeah, it blows me away how powerful it is. So I, I loved that idea of this book of calling in, calling in that person calling in the, the person. place of love and expansion. And I love, I love the visual of you standing there, you know, having been doing this projection right in front of you boom because <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't looking for it I just remember my mom mm. being, and I need that and I've still got it I've still got the cd I've kept it I've got it in my little special box and it was just yeah manifest your goals and dreams <clears throat> I didn't know I was going to manifest <laughs> him <laughs> There you go. Yeah. Well, you know, the joke, the joke I always tell everybody every time I interview Glenn um, is uh, 
you know, that I have spent many nights sleeping with Glenn. I know so many women have. <laughs> so many women have, yeah. It's okay, I don't and, mind. <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, there's some magic about Glenn's work. So I think, oh, you know, is. he was yeah. putting it out there for you as well. Yeah, and if and even if you look back, so when we did actually meet, um, which was online, but how we connected, we both broke up with people on the same day not not serious relationships at the time but it was the 21st of June so it was his birthday and the summer solstice and I broke up with someone that I've been seeing for a couple of months so did he and then it was the next day I sent a message saying I'll belated happy birthday and we just got chatting and I was I was coming to the end of my hypnotherapy training at that time and you know we had so much in common um, and it was just this magical thing that never would we have known it at the time. We say now, even when we first met in person, it, it wasn't an instant, oh, wow, you know, let's fall in love and get married. Um, but it was, yeah, what an incredible journey we've been on. So, yeah, mm. I'm so blessed. But that book, I think that's probably why that book Everyone's going to buy it now. Everyone's yeah. going <laughs> to exactly. buy it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, what a great uh, endorsement that is for the book. Yeah. Um, so book number three, um, this has turned up a few times, Dying to Be Me, mm. um, My Journey from Cancer to Near Death to True Healing by Anita yeah. Muljani. Yeah. Uh, lovely, lovely book, lovely yeah. lady. Yeah special special book really hit home because not only is it just a phenomenal story I mean her story alone is just yeah it's incredible isn't it and again the power of, of healing and what can actually happen what we can experience and I think what it touched in me was I was recognizing in myself what she was saying you know the lack of love for the self the pushing and yeah. the and the striving so I think that's why it had to be on this list because not only does it deserve to be because it's just a fantastic book but it did it had an effect on me and really made me look at myself and and realize you know the, these are again it builds upon what you learn from you can heal your life and what you learn on that journey as you yeah. start to understand yourself and how physical dis-ease you know manifests and how it can manifest from from all this stuff um you know the perfectionism and that strive and not feeling good enough which I think is a core belief of, of so so many of us it's such a thing that we have to work on feeling good enough but hearing her story it was what what she learned about why the disease had manifested and what how her life before had led her to that, that just completely blew me away and was like, wow, okay, yeah, I have to learn. You know, I want to, I want to learn to be more gentle with myself, which is a constant um, thing for me to always come back to. You always have to come back to it, don't you? Whatever your thing sort of is that you, you struggle with where it's not feeling good enough or what your fears yeah. are and what's there in you, you just come back and revisit it but that book really yeah encouraged me to 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 change that and and channel that energy and be passionate and be driven but really learn to have a softer approach to myself and learn that now rather than being forced to to sort of learn it you know, I'm a big believer in consciously going to those places within us that that need to be looked at rather than waiting for life to happen something to happen that forces us to look within so everything that happens now every pain or niggle or feeling you know I question that self-inquiry that self-awareness it is a daily a daily practice something daily that happens so naturally yeah. now it is it's such a, a such a powerful one it's such a powerful one um so yeah, what what an uh, what an incredible woman who by sharing her message from you know what she went through, what she experienced, what an amazing thing to share with people. Um, yeah, fantastic book. So I'm not surprised it's been on yeah, you know, the list. It's one times. of those classics. Yeah. 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 Book number four is Red Moon by mm. Miranda Gray, and you say that um, this was an absolutely life changing book. Life changing. For you as well. 
yeah, yeah. this was a completely life-changing book again I don't know how I came across this book they seem to find me um so this was a whole new concept for me I mean like you said earlier my area is female empowerment so it's a passion of mine anyway and I think it's been um just generally it's been you know the rising of the divine feminine the awakening of the divine feminine it's been up hasn't it for so many of us women and men and finding this book so Miranda talks about um the the spiritual aspects of the menstrual cycle and the four phases of the cycle and the four phases of our lives and how um she uses archetypes to um describe the different aspects of the feminine within and without and she talks about how our menstrual cycles are um you know they reflect so much to us and depending on how we feel at certain phases for example the premenstrual phase when so many women uh you know find that the most difficult one that's she calls it the enchantress it's like the wild woman archetype that really is trying to you know rise and burst out now it's been very suppressed but it's the it's the archetypal energy within us women that is um free free with words honest you know she demands you know equality and so that phase of the cycle really if there's anything there that we're not seeing to we're not looking at we're we're pushing we're pushing down say for example we're in a relationship um that is not as healthy as we want it to be we don't feel like we're being treated with respect you know we might let stuff go but then in that you know premenstrual phase boom the anger can come out you know the anger the impatience the sadness the grief the 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 more chaotic kind of wild energies but if we can become conscious we learn to live cyclically and in our you know the world we live in now <laughs> I mean, I have felt, I won't speak for every woman, but I feel, and most, you know, my friends feel the same women I speak to. There's a lot of expectation that we feel to keep going all cycle long or all lifelong, um, to push, to strive and to live more from our more masculine energies that yes. we've got in us. <clears throat> and so actually to say, do you know what? No, I need to retreat. So I'm going to do just what's necessary. And I'm going to give myself that gift and honor that more inward energy where I can connect with my intuition and um, rest. <laughs> so physically, uh, if, if we look at it in terms of the cycle, we're supposed to be resting. We're coming down. We're feeling that retreat. It's like the seasons. You know, it doesn't yeah. the sun doesn't shine all of the time? We've got the winter. It's important for us to retreat, and it's in that retreat and that hibernation, if you like, that so many insights can come to us and we're so deeply connected to to spirit whatever that feels for us um so miranda's book red moon it completely transformed how i felt about my cycle what my cycle was showing to me and it almost it helped me give myself permission to live as a cyclical woman rather yeah. than feeling like everything needs to be perfect all the time there is a time where I can burn the candle at both ends and it's great and then there's a time when oh my god just looking after the kids is like hard oh, getting through the day is is tiring and it's hard work and that's okay that's not only is it okay it's, it's necessary because as women we are blessed with this amazing intuition and this ability to to tap into that bigger, that deeper wisdom, but we need to give ourselves space to do that. We're busy yeah. all of the time pushing ourselves. Um, so this actually became quite a foundation for my future work. And um, I was actually meditating one day and it, I received this message to contact Miranda and ask her if she would be interested in collaborating on some kind of... Uh, you know, audio program where she'd be the, you know, she'd, she'd teach people this work and then I would do the meditation with my business partner at the time. And so I thought, okay, well, <laughs> I'll send an email, not expecting to hear back, but I did hear back and we did collaborate on two albums. Uh, one was called Red Moon uh, and the teaching. So Miranda would um, 
teach teach women about the four different phases of the cycle and of of life uh, and myself and Sam who I was working with at the time we would do the meditations to to match that um and it was so I mean she was just so brilliant she lives and breathes these teachings and she's such a brilliant teacher um of this ancient wisdom that you know thousands of years ago women knew this stuff yes. women would yes. would retreat and men yeah. highly respected the women of the village because yeah. in their time of retreat they would download this information and men would listen and and there's this is wanting to happen again for there to be balance in ourselves yeah. and then in the world um so this was yeah again it just you know my friend at the time I gave it to her to read and she read it and she said it was just like her Bible. <laughs> you know, it was just something you can go back to and remind yourself of time and time again. And I just think I wish all women knew it. I wish all women knew this information from a young age because their view of their cycle and of being a woman, their femininity yes. and understanding all aspects, especially the ones that our patriarchal system tends to repress, it, oh wow what would happen if it, the power the power in it the manifesting power and um, just what can come of it yeah I feel so passionate about it so it had to be on the list <laughs> this yeah one. yeah absolutely I mean I checked it out when I read your list because I hadn't heard of it and yeah. um, you know it says this book offers women an understanding of their cyclic nature and its yeah. need for expression through creativity sexuality and spirituality yeah and yeah I mean absolutely we all need yeah. to reconnect definitely with that. yeah um, exactly brilliant brilliant book so <laughs> book number five spirit babies how oh. to communicate with the child you're meant to have book. by Walter McEachin is that I how you pronounce his really name um and you said that before you had your eldest son you felt his spirit presence around yeah. you for seven I would years. say even before I met Glenn even going back to quite young I could <clears> feel again I, I always <clears throat> I always knew babies children it was it was an important part of my future that was something I was a hundred percent off a very young age I just knew I wanted children and I think as my <clears throat> as my spiritual uh, self grew and evolved I then became more intuitive to you know sensing energy and always felt just this I think I even used to have dreams I used to have dreams of holding two babies and so this book I absolutely love because it was a whole new world for me and that's the thing a lot of these books like with Red Moon it it opened me up to something new that I had never heard of before and Spirit Babies was the same and so it was about you know beyond the physical of becoming pregnant and fertility and all of that it was about the spiritual aspects of conceiving a child bringing a child into the world uh, soul contracts um, and and how those spirits of the babies can can hover around you in your aura close to you for years even um to to get a sense of you and it just blew me away there's some lovely real life stories in there of like couples who've been struggling to conceive um and there was something that needed to happen between you know the parents and the spirit baby before the spirit baby felt that they could they could come in it was just amazing to feel that you can communicate with your children before yeah. they're even born what I mean what a special magical magical thing so especially when I met Glenn and then we were serious and I knew there'd be children in our future <laughs> he didn't at the time <laughs> he didn't know they were there but I knew <laughs> And um, it was it was just really special to even before Eden was conceived to be able to get a sense of his energy and almost like what what he needed um, from me and and to be able to receive that information of where I needed to grow spiritually or practically what needed to you know what needed to happen. Um, it was just amazing. And then I think when I was actually pregnant with him as well, it made that connection. Um, it was deeper. It wasn't such a new yeah. 
a new a new soul you know I, I kind of knew him I knew him already so what and a it's just a beautiful book and the spirit baby world as he calls it and these spirit babies and especially now because there are so many special souls incarnating into this world to make a difference and sensitive souls like my eldest Eden he's very very sensitive and I think that's it. I think what they need from us, it's like they need us to, to have an understanding so that we know how to help them thrive so that they can fulfill their mission. And I just loved what this book had to say, contracts, you know, soul contracts we make before we come into this life. And, you know, we sign that, you know, sign the contract. I will be your mother. You'll be my son. This is what we'll learn from each other. And this is what we'll do. And, yeah, so it's just a really heart, really connect with that whole world. Makes it into a much more sacred process, doesn't it? Oh, it's it? so sacred. Yeah. Mm. I think one of the books that impacted me um, many years ago was a book called Parenting Begins Before Conception. And it's very wow. similar. I mean, it mm. was about connecting to your child and dealing with your stuff before yeah. you become the parent. And yeah. um, so many people just, you know, well, I'm pregnant and I'm going to, you know yeah give birth to this kid and whatever yeah. it's and uh, I think a it's cavalier a of, experience yeah totally and we don't realize do we that until you do realize that you know when they're in the womb preconception it all it's all doing you know they're, they're absorbing stuff it's that um it does it begins right there just because they're there and they're not born yet they're taking stuff in, you know, they're aware of your energy and, exactly. and you there as you're so connected. They're, they're there, they're present, they're with you. They've joined the family already. Yeah. Um, but it's lovely because it covers miscarriage, abortion and, and the spiritual energetic aspects of that, which I think is lovely and would help a lot of people to with maybe come to yeah. peace, mm. um, let guilt go, let uh, anything that's holding them back, any sort of trauma. It's a really beautiful, you know, really lovely, beautiful teachings and a very special book that is, is needed. Mm. Yeah. Uh, same with the next one, which is uh, Nurturing Your Baby's Soul, a spiritual yeah. guide for expectant parents by Elizabeth Clare Prophet. Yeah. Yeah, so um, we kind of carried on. It almost... Mm. Uh, it carried on because I'd read Spirit Babies and then I wanted to find a book. So this one I kind of sought out. I was looking for something to to teach me, something that was maybe more practical, practical things, meditation, things that I can do while I was pregnant to, um, to connect with the baby, communicate with the baby. Uh, but this book, uh, yeah, it talks about you can read it before you're pregnant, while you're pregnant, even after when the children are born, it's still extremely useful. And again, how you, she teaches you how you can cleanse the, the soul, like the baby's soul with, you know, the light of the violet flame. She's got these amazing meditations and certain chants. And she talks about connecting with goddess Kuan Yin. So I used to listen to um, chants and mantras. And yeah, how you can actually affect the karma of the child, like in a positive way, you can help to cleanse their soul before they actually are born. Um, and it, again, similar to spirit babies, but when you're pregnant and you you read this one, Nurturing Your Baby's Soul, it's, um, again, it's one you can keep going back to. So I would read it throughout my pregnancy, learn the meditations, practice them, and I'd done a lot of shamanic work by that point that I got pregnant. We'd we'd been to Panama, Glenn and I, and doing lots of ceremonial work. And he told me actually that there was a baby present. So all of that work and then reading that book and the, the cleansing, not only of myself, protection as well. It was so much of it was about protecting the baby, protecting the energy, protecting the pregnancy. So it was, you know, right up my street at the time. I absolutely loved it. It gave me something to, you know, it wasn't just about then all eating well for the baby. It was, you know, looking at the spiritual aspect too. Um, and he was breech as well until 36 weeks. And I, you know, I was all set for home birth, which was so important to me. And he was breached until 36 weeks and it was looking, you know, we could have still done the home birth, but it was going to complicate things. And it made me, oh, it was, you know, a nerve wracking time. 
but even connecting with him spiritually and seeing that it's not just oh he's breach it's like okay there's something in him that's a little bit scared and apprehensive about getting ready to come into the world so being able to communicate with the baby and help them to feel secure was you know that's amazing and that's what the book teaches you to communicate with that soul I know you're a big advocate of conscious parenting um, and your seventh book is The Highly Sensitive Child, Helping Our mm. Children Thrive When the World Overwhelms Them yeah. by Elaine Aron. And, you know, as you've pointed out, and I know and many of us listening know that uh, the kids today are so much, much more sensitive I think yeah. more highly attuned and I think this mm. is why so many of them have a challenge being here um, you know right. this world is is a bit much for them Definitely. and they go off the rails or mm. they get into drugs or they just want to yeah. you know step back from it all mm. and reject everything we stand for um, yeah. so what was it about this book particularly that um, that you enjoyed yeah I think because when I had Eden, he from day one, I knew, you know, he was very sensitive, very, very sensitive. And <clears throat> it was almost like as well for quite a long time. It, and I remember Glenn saying this as well. It's like he's uncomfortable in his body. And I always got the sense that he was, you know, this very sensitive soul. And then he reincarnated again into this body that aches or teeth are coming through and you know the world can be loud or overwhelming and I always felt like it took him a good couple of years <laughs> to to actually get used to being in the body again he always seemed unsettled like on from an outside point of view it was like he was just I felt like it took a lot of work to um to to keep him settled yeah. um so I knew that he was really sensitive you know his sleep I mean you know I, I didn't get any sleep for quite a few years <laughs> you know hourly at one point he'd be waking in the night wanting to breastfeed which I loved I loved the breastfeeding journey but it, he, he was just um I just knew he was sensitive and I was sensitive I am sensitive so it was nice because I could recognize that in him early. And so reading this book, it was more like the confirmation. It helped me to feel really confident in how I was raising him. You know, I was very, I absolutely yeah. loved attachment parenting. It just felt right for me. He was always attached. It was when he was happiest in the wrap, I'd be doing the hoovering, whatever it was I had to do, he was there <laughs> with me um co-slept still co-sleep with both of them and I absolutely loved that way of parenting and I think there's a lot of judgment upon that and I was quite young you know I was 20 20 I just turned 27 the week before I had Eden so I was still you know young I had the children quite young and it's hard when there's um quite a heavy mm, favor of you know, letting them cry out or leaving them. But for me, it didn't feel right. And I think every parent should be free to make their choices based on their individual child and to listen to the children and do what you feel right. And, and so this book, reading it and it, can, it, it confirming that, yeah, he's a highly sensitive baby and, you know, child and the, the, the right way for me and him was not to push and still to this day it's exactly the same I am you know he's six now I can't believe he's six <laughs> but seeing him develop and come out of himself and he goes to tennis lessons we've got a lovely piano teacher that comes in he loves music and to see him you know the piano teacher came in for the first time a couple of weeks ago and he went off, you know, off into the living room with her to the piano, was absolutely fine. That was new because when he was younger, you know, he found it really difficult. I think being around anyone he didn't, he didn't know. Um, so I love this book because it, it gave me uh, a strong sense of, yeah, um, this is, this is what's right for him. Yeah. And yeah. regardless of what anyone else thinks, I have to do. And it's and it's my my job to do what's right for him. And if I feel that, and I had the knowledge, it's not like, oh, I didn't understand, 
you know, I didn't understand I had a sensitive child. I knew. And so it was my, my role as his, as his mother. And he chose me for a reason. He chose me and Glenn for a reason. Yeah. And yeah. Um, we were able to give him what, you know, what he needed. What he and needed. we try to, yeah. you know, continue that. And, um, and then when Noah was born, there's two years between them. So they're quite close. He he's sensitive, but not in the same way. I wouldn't say he's um, I still did the same, you know, you know, the same attachment parenting. I loved it, you know, having them attached to me all the time when they were really little. Um, but you can see the difference with Eden. It takes a lot more uh, consciousness, you know, you have to be yeah. really conscious, especially like with the anger. So um, even as an example, yesterday, we're homeschooling, we've got an amazing teacher who comes in, and um, they adore her, it's really beautiful. And, and he kind of, when I came down to kind of get him at the end, he, he wanted to show me something. And I was chatting to some, I was chatting to the, you know, their teacher, Kay, and he got really upset with me and started screaming. And it was kind of out of nowhere. I thought, wow, God, that's not like him. It's so easy to like, you know, to, to tell him off, <laughs> so, you know, yes. but I knew it was something, you know, and I do obviously, but it, I could tell, I could tell there was a difference between him pushing boundaries and him you being really tired and he was exhausted. I think he was just really, really, really tired. And it was just this like emotional release. And so, yeah. you know, this book and other articles and written by other people who understand this, it, uh, it, ga- it gives me that understanding and that, uh, that confidence to really follow that through and to know, you know, when there's a time for, you know setting a boundary and when there's a time for coming down to his level yeah yeah. i mean like wow he just he needs a bit of downtime you know attunement isn't it it's encouraging you to attune to the child and understand what it is they're asking for i love the quote that you put at the end of your um description where you said um that elaine aaron's mantra is to have an exceptional child you must be willing to have an exceptional child yeah isn't that great? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. he is. Yeah. He's an exceptional little soul. Such a bright light. And, mm. and they, they both are just feel so blessed. They're just two little lights. And yeah, I hope I'm, you know, getting it right. <laughs> I'm sure you are. <laughs> I mean, I hope Judging, so. <laughs> You're certainly willing yeah. to do whatever's necessary to get yeah. it right. And, and I actually, think that's the most we can ask yeah and it's, it's the other side of it as well that when you do make a mistake because you know you're human too and you get pushed and yeah. you know I'm so actually being a highly sensitive parent is difficult as well because that you know that I mean, parenting is so full-on anyway um you know and you do you make mistakes and Glenn and I talk about this a lot and I think it's being conscious of your stuff and your little tendencies and what you can work on without beating yourself up because I think there's so much guilt in you know as as a mum as a dad and because you want to do the right thing um but you do make mistakes but then I always think they learn um by making a mistake and then saying sorry and and putting it right you teach them that it's okay to make mistakes as well which I think is important especially for Eden because I see in him already that perfectionist tendency and that um desire to sort of to please I'm really aware of of that (laughs) yeah yeah Yeah. Mm. so book number eight is the empath survival guide life strategies for sensitive people by Judy Orloff yeah so this um again it carries on (laughs) you can see the theme of where I was at each time as I went along because this was actually it was my healer I've got an amazing shamanic healer and in my first session with her she said um you know you're an empath and there's an amazing book I recommend. So I, yeah, I bought the book and I read it. And it, I always knew I was really sensitive. And I under, understood that a lot within myself, because I think as you, you know, you read these books and you're on your own journey, you do, you just learn more and more and more about yourself and what you need. But this book really highlighted and again, confirmed how you are is, is fine. It, you're not 
over this or too sensitive or too much of this or too much of that it's that you are that's just you are highly sensitive you are an empath and you're taking on you you easily absorb other people's emotions and pain and what's going on which I kind of think is why I never really needed to drink when I was young and I go out I never felt the need because I didn't feel good on alcohol again being sensitive it didn't suit me but I would completely pick up on the environment and everyone else was kind of drunk and having a good time and I could just soak it up and it's the same now with you know with whoever I'm with and especially being a therapist this is the thing that you have to learn to you can feel it but you can't take it on as your own and this book teaches you through different self-care practices meditations you know, protecting yourself, protecting your energy, um, how to live in the world as a as an empath, as a highly sensitive person, and still thrive. And again, give yourself permission to live according to your own, just who you are, rather than what the yeah. world. So socializing, there can be a pressure to socialize a lot, or it's okay to say no as a sensitive sensitive person. This is what I teach my clients. I'm very big on boundaries and saying no and feel it's okay to, to think, oh, I'm so exhausted and I feel overloaded. I don't want to burn out. I need, I need to stay in or I need to have a little break or step outside of society for a couple of days and, and just rejuvenate. Um, so the, the self-care for anyone is important, but when you're an empath, especially when you're, if you're working, you're on, you know, transport and you're just very heavily in the world. If you're not aware, it can feel that it's, it's, you know, if you're feeling anxious or, or depressed or heavy in some way, it might not be your stuff. You know, it could yeah. be someone else's, someone else's. That you've been coming into contact with. Um, and so it teaches you how to, use your empathic abilities as a gift which it is a gift uh, but for many people it doesn't feel like a gift it feels like a curse and yeah, so that's yeah. why I love this book mm. it helps you to 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 transform and to transform how you see it through living differently living according to it rather than trying to deny it in some yes. way yeah so yeah, that was yeah. really helpful and also learning what kind of empath you are some people are physical empaths taking mm. on the pain I'm not as much only with the children if they were teething I'd get a toothache sometimes but generally it's more emotional energetic with yeah. me it's the energy of I can see someone and just get a feeling and that can be harder because it's, it's yeah not, you know it's not so tangible no, exactly. And it's like you can get a funny feeling about something. And yeah. I know to so trust my instincts, but there's no logic to back it up most of yeah. the time. It's like, you know, yeah. that's not right. Or, oh, that is right. And like looking back, what we said about buying that CD when I was 19 and how it led me to Glenn, there was something, it's that intuition and feeling in to the energy of, of, of his work and his CD there or with the children feeling into yeah what what they're feeling or what they're going through and it's all it's just the consciousness it's just bringing consciousness to everything yeah so yeah. that you can bring some kind of balance and self-care practice so that you don't drown in it so yeah. many people do and so many healers do I feel mm. drown yeah. within all the stuff that they take mm. on so responsibility and um not taking on excess responsibility, which is something that's become apparent for me recently. Um, it, it's so, yeah, it's just so important to know what's mm. ours and yeah. what's theirs. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I love what you wrote about the next book. Um, I think this is something that every woman needs to be reminded of. The book is Womb Wisdom, Awakening the Creative and Forgotten Powers of the Feminine mm -hmm. by Anaya and Padma Aeon Prakasha. And you wrote, in more ancient times, women knew that their womb was so much more than a physical organ. The womb is a sacred energy center, which births not only children, but also mm -hmm. our ideas, projects, personal healing relationships, and so on. So yeah. true, 
So true. so true. And I think this is ancient knowledge that so badly wants to be remembered. And that's mm. why, thank goodness, thank goddess, <laughs> there, there, is, um, there are some amazing female teachers, healers, finding their niche within this. I mean, it all comes back to just remembering our innate power and our ability to create from that deeply divine space and how the womb and regardless of even whether you have a physical womb like in my work with the menstrual cycle some women will say well I've had a hysterectomy does that affect me no because it's an energy center that we're Mm. working with and um and you know this book was great for helping you to release uh, trauma, you know, womb trauma, obvious womb trauma from past relationships, past lives, times before, there's something called the witch wound, um, from where women were, you know, we think of the witch hunt days, and yeah. how women were branded a certain way for practicing, you know, using essential oils, this is what they were calling witches, um, herbs, and how women were completely oh wow just tortured for it and that whole repression of all of that and the in our in our lineage and in our conscious the you know the collective energy of the feminine that is that trauma in our in our wombs and so I I feel that this is why so many women hold themselves back and feel scared to really step forward and own themselves and own their abilities I've had to do a lot of work on this and I still kind of do um because it's so strong it's almost like it's not safe for me to be in my power uh, to be in my power to be this voice of wisdom to use my voice you know it's, it's not it's not safe um so clearing the womb of you know energy from past relationships it doesn't have to be bad energy it could be from a very loving relationship but when that relationship ends and you move into you know new yeah. relationships that energy can still be there, you know, in, in the womb. So this book was really great for uh, for helping women to remember and reawaken that power and how it really is an energy center from which we can birth so much because it's not really, we don't usually think of the womb unless it's about pregnancy or it's a very, it's kind of just, oh, it's there, but it's not, there's not really a lot of consciousness around it. Um, But when we can, it's almost, I almost see it as a place of, you know, my deep soul's wisdom and place of creation. So again, you know, if you're not creating, using our fertility, if you're not creating a child, you can, you know, we're creating something else. Um, And it houses so much. So when we can first connect with our womb and then do the healing, do the cleansing, it, you know, it's like the layers, isn't it? The more we remove, the more light can come through. That's the visuals that I get when we can remove the stuff that doesn't belong there. We can awaken that powerful place of, of creation and manifestation and um, walk in our power use our voice and how powerful would it be <laughs> if, if we felt as women that we can really do that and support each other in doing that as well um, and join together for rituals and practices that really honor the womb and, 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 and all it is and all it holds energetically and spiritually yeah mm-hmm. yeah I agree with you and much of this is beginning to come back now it really is this knowledge yeah yeah so book number 10 is the book of Lilith yeah by Jungian analyst Barbara Black Coltov um and you <laughs> came across this when you were doing some very deep work with a shaman in yeah. Central America yeah, yeah, this is a huge one. And it's always quite difficult to verbalize uh, this kind of Lilith energy. So in mythological, you know, it, the story of Lilith is that when we think of the first man, the first woman, we're told Adam and Eve. But the story says that before Eve, Lilith was the first woman and Adam, the first wife of Adam, And Adam and Lilith were born from the same dust in the earth. They were made completely, to be completely equal. And and the story is that 
you know, Lilith really demanded that equality in the relationship. She wanted that freedom to, to be herself and for them both to be completely equal and work in, you know, that union together. But that Adam wanted to overpower her and be the one in control. And so the story says, you know, she left Adam, she went to the caves and, um, co you know, created children with demons. And, you know, it's one of, it's one of those ancient stories. But what, her, what this book does and what this whole work around Lilith does, it's more about what she embodies and what she represents for women, men too, but it's more obviously, uh, you know, if we look at what that energy is in women, she embodies the darker side of the feminine. And by dark, we don't mean evil or, um, you know, yeah, evil in some way. It's the anger, it's the rage. So it's called, you know, Lilith rage. If we say it's that Lilith rage. And she represents the anger and rage that is usually dormant in women because, again, we're told, you know, being angry isn't ladylike, to be rageful. Oh, no, no, no. So we'll sweep that under the carpet. We'll keep the peace. Mm. And um, it's the shadow work. She represents yeah. that... Um, that part of us that demands equality to not equality in the sense oh we want to do the same as men it's just that freedom to be who we are I actually had to look over this book and I even made a few notes because it's such an experience when you read a book like this and you meditate on goddess Lilith's energy so much of it is experience it can be hard to verbalize but she's this fiery free spirit that if we can connect with her and accept our anger and our rage, it can transform and it can be, uh, you know, transformed and channeled into passion and uh, for, for whatever it is, you know, we are, we are feeling. I'm going to look to my notes because I remember it's the energy that refuses to, to be, you know, pushed down in a relationship repressed, yeah. Yeah, yeah repressed exactly so her energy is all about the shadow it's all about looking at our shadow looking at our rage and even what I was saying about the witch wound and when we were talking about the womb this is the stuff this is this is the kind of work it's that nitty gritty you know we can sit in a yoga pose and feel peaceful and do a chakra meditation which is amazing but I feel like unless we really, really go to the dark places, eat deep into our shadow, what we've pushed away and what's not being seen, I feel like it's there that the real breakthroughs happen. And she helps us to do that. And um, she's when she's free, when she's able to express that rage and that anger, then she can be free and it's boundary. She can teach us how to set boundaries because a lot of the time this, the rage, the anger, and again, it all ties in with the other books I've got on the list about the menstrual cycle and the womb. It's usually our boundaries are, are created, you know, young um, from what we're taught about the world or what we're taught it means to be a woman. And it's this wild woman architect. And by wild, I don't mean like out of control and completely, you know, <laughs> taking drugs and do, you know, getting mad tattoos. It's it's wild as in free and connected yeah. with nature and very expressive yeah. and very primal. It's like a very primal energy. Um, and kind of calling out the the, you know, the what what's not what's not right and so seeing that in a relationship or seeing it in the world or seeing it in ourselves and calling it out and putting a mirror there that's kind of what she does I feel like when you when you consciously call upon her energy a healer told me once he said when you call upon goddess Lilith and the same with goddess Kali it she'll show up but be prepared for it because she's gonna really take you <laughs> Yeah. She's going to take you to some places where you really have to get comfortable with stuff that actually you've not been comfortable with um, before. But when we can experience our, our anger and listen and, and hear what it's actually trying to tell us, I think that's so healing because then, yeah. you know, we don't, because it's behind the anger, there's usually, or if not always, the grief, the sadness, the trauma, everything else yeah. that's underneath yeah. it. 
Um, and she's the queen of the shadow work. And um, yeah, she, so, so it's, it's a very deep book. It's, it's probably a book you, you kind of get into further down the line when you've done some healing work before and you understand a little bit about um, the shadow uh, and what, what that means and what it's like when you start that and how difficult it, it, it can be. It can really push you kind of to your knees almost. Yeah, yeah. It, but, but wow, how but amazing I think it is. That that's that's the, the power of you know, yeah. the feminine um Definitely, that yeah. protective you know um mother yes. you know bear um yeah. you know as you're talking I'm thinking about I recently came across a, a movie on Netflix um and it was the story of Helen Reddy okay. um and you know her iconic song uh anthemic song I am woman hear me roar yeah and exactly. her, I never knew her story I didn't know I that know. she too to had that. been repressed by her husband and wow. pushed down and push, pushed aside. And yeah, um, yeah um, very, very powerful. Very powerful. And I think we need to, or I have found, uh, um, again, it's responsibility that was really keen. That's what she, she shows me. We can't, you can call out what's wrong, but when you start blaming, it's because of this, they repress me, they do this. We don't tap into our power that yeah. way. That's the place of victimhood. Whereas when we can say, and actually really learn more about who we are, let this aspect of ourselves out and look at our boundaries. Again, this is why we clients, I'm so hot on the boundaries and always bringing it back to, you know, someone can do you wrong and it's not excusing any ill treatment, of course, from anybody else, but it is coming back as like, okay, you know, what, what is it? How have I, uh, you know, what do I need to put in place yeah. to um, to protect me, to empower me? How can I feel my most empowered self and still, um, you can be all parts of, you know, the feminine. And again, again, going back to the red moon, this is what I learned with the archetypes. We've got the maiden who's like the young virginal, you know, which is, you know, a common archetype. You look at fairy tales, you know, Snow White. And then you've got like the, the mother, the mother phase. And then um, as soon as we come into the wild woman, it's, it's not really there. And then you've got the chrome, which is just branded this old haggy kind of witch. Mm. But the word chrome came from the, um, is it a crown? You know, it means crown as in queen. And it's that as women age and, and be, we become wiser and accumulate more wisdom, it's they're the aspects of the feminine that have been completely, you know, repressed yes. need to come back because it's this, you know, this wisdom that grows. And so when women can heal and let their anger out in a safe place, in a safe way. And there's some amazing healers and teachers who do all of this amazing kind of shadow work and literally have women roaring like animals and letting mm. that anger out. That can be so freeing. I mean, that sense of freedom that can come for that from that is just um, needed. Yeah. So yeah. needed. Yeah. 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 So that's that's your 10 best list. Yeah. Um, you recently have had uh, some experiences with a yeah. lady who's taught you much, a lady <laughs> ayahuasca. I have. Um, you know, we we have a few minutes. Tell us a little yeah, bit about perfect. that. Yeah, so this has been extremely, and it actually ties in really well with the, the Lilith energy yeah. that I've just been talking about. Um, so ayahuasca, the plant medicine. Um, I did my first ceremony last year in October, which was incredible. And it, it's so, again, it can be hard to verbalize your experience, but the intelligence of the medicine, you know, you will drink this, you know, the plant medicine. I've done two ceremonies. It was the same medicine, and but had completely different effects. I had a completely different journey because she gives you what you need. And she, again, you face your shadow. You are not in control of choosing where you go. She takes you where you need to go. Um, so I did a retreat a week ago. And, and that, the reason for my go, my intention, I've been doing some work on um, healing ancestral trauma. 
in my mother line clearing some trauma um, because just like we inherit genes and the DNA, I believe, you know, we inherit if, if, yeah. if certain traumas are not seen to and, and healed or just brought into the light, we just carry it down. And I think especially through the, the mother daughter line as well, I feel like mm. it can be really strong. Um, so I went to the ceremony with that intention and it was, it was a really difficult six hours so I drank the medicine the medicine and you know so it's at night you're in uh, the pit you know in the dark and I didn't see I did in my visions I don't see mother ayahuasca but I can feel her there and actually what was amazing I saw my nan who died when I was eight I saw her and all of my ancestors behind her, the females, and she was beaming and she was saying, thank you for the work you've done. You've released us, you've released us from that pain. And she was saying, there's no work for you to do for us in this ceremony, but for this kind of ancestral work to be complete, you need to heal it within yourself. The stuff that you know I've inherited, I need to clear. So I thought, yeah, great. <laughs> That's why I'm here. And and I and then I had like the worst migraine of my life. And um, oh, I felt so ill. I was so, so sick. But the medicine was saying to me, this pattern that I need to clear, it's a pattern of over-responsibility and taking on other people's pain. And she was saying, you know, I can't take that from you. You need to release yourself from this pain. So, okay. <laughs> and it, it was almost like putting a car in front of me and saying, well, I can't move it. You have to pick it up and move it for it to be the road ahead to be clear. And it's like, well, how, how am I going to do that? Um, and she was showing me my, my strong will. She was showing me my strength and how it was, you know, on one hand, amazing for me because it was helping me for once to get through this ceremony to to have the courage to go into this sort of ceremony where I know I'm going to be you know pushed but I was holding on to this responsibility that I'd taken from others I didn't want to give it back there was a part of me that didn't want to give it back and I think it's that part of us especially when you're a healer and you come into this life and you have such a, a compassion for wanting to help other people when you're young, especially when you're a child and you're a sensitive child, you can just take on, you want to take on everyone else's stuff so that they don't suffer. So the medicine was saying you need to let go of that and kind of give the responsibility back. It's not yours to hold. Um, and it was hard. And so ayahuasca it has a purging effect. So, you know, you're being sick. And I was really sick for hours trying to, to clear this this part of me that was so stubborn in letting go and mother ayahuasca was saying to me how badly are you going to suffer before you give it up yeah yeah and so yeah. she kind of made it was a bit it was a tough love that's that's kind of what it was it was this tough love how ill are you going to feel how bad how how many times do you need to be violently sick and have this pain in your head for you to give it up and say, I'm done. I don't want to do this anymore. Um, so it was that. That's where I was for hours, being sick, horrific pain. And then when the ceremony ended, I, I still hadn't completed what needed to be complete. And my fear at the time was, oh, my God, what if this is over? And then I haven't, you know, I haven't got that out of me. So I went back to the house where I was staying. They were amazing, the people facilitating the ceremony. And I said, you know, you'll probably continue to purge. I'm thinking, good, because this is not done yet. And um, I tried to doze. You don't really sleep. You go in and out. But as soon as I would think about um, someone, maybe someone else's pain or something, I could literally feel my stomach turn and I'd be sick. And it's like, it's not yours. It's not yours. Don't take it on. And that went on for a while. And then I came to a point and I said out loud, I need this to end. I need this, you know, I'm done with this. I don't want this anymore. Yes. I don't want this pain. I don't want to suffer in this way. And then I saw a vision of a gate. And Mother Ayahuasca was saying, you've done it. You've reached the end. This is, this is where it ends. I was really, really sick again for the next five minutes, very intensely. But I could feel 
that was it. That was, this was the completion yeah, of the yeah. work. Giving it up. That's it. It was like, yeah, I felt like I was on my knees. <laughs> That's what she does. You know, the, she just puts you where you need to be and you just have to trust she'll get you there. So even though the fear was, oh my God, what if I can't release this? Trust the medicine, trust the medicine because it is, it's, it's a master healer. Um, and then I felt, you know, physically, I'm still feeling really exhausted. Obviously, it was a huge thing, but the sense of freedom that I'm that I am experiencing, and it's amazing because my mum, when I, you know, when I was doing the ancestral work leading up to the ceremony, my mum was a huge part of that, and it's been really lovely to uncover stuff that happened in our family, things and souls who were lost that wanted to be acknowledged. So it's been a re I feel like it's done such a beautiful thing for for my family because even though we don't see it with the eye, this sort of work and clearing this, uh, the ripple effect. Yes. that goes out to the souls yeah. in the family but the souls that have come before and the souls that will come after is truly amazing and I have to share the most incredible story um two nights ago I I went to bed and then I woke up around midnight and um I'd had like obviously nothing hallucinogenic or anything like that and uh, it was a few days after the ceremony and I was laying there and I've had these out of body experiences before where I, you know, I go off and I could feel something was going to happen. And I was laying there and it was as if I'd had ayahuasca. I hadn't obviously, but it was as if I had my spirit left my body and I traveled to my, my parents' house back in the UK. And I was literally walking around the house and I saw my mum, and then I went to the house I grew up in and then I was, and I, I was not dreaming and I was not imagining this was happening to me. I was off. And then I was floating, flying down these tunnels of sacred geometrical colors and shapes. And I was being told that I was receiving codes. I was receiving this spiritual information, which you can't understand with a logical mind. You just <laughs> accept. Mm. Um, and then I saw two goddesses kind of floating in front of me and they were holding boxes and they said this is ancient knowledge and they were kind of transferring the um the the teachings the energy to me and then when I kind of came back out of that back into the room it was 10 past one in the morning then the next so the following day when I woke up I text my mum and I said oh I said oh God, you know I had an out-of-body experience and I said um I came to came to your house at 1am she said oh my goodness she said, I was still awake at one o'clock and that at that exact time so I was sitting on the sofa and I saw a shadow move through the kitchen and the near the kitchen she said, it's like this light kind of feminine floaty shadow <laughs> it was me <laughs> I was actually there and it just blew me away it was the exact time that I was there in the house and and she saw something and this is you know she's in the UK I'm in Portugal and this is what the medicine does you drink and you have this amazingly powerful ceremony but the work continues and it removes mm. these layers of, of stuff that you just don't need. And then you just open up and it's just, um, and I'm only a week, you know, it was a week ago today, tonight that I was there drinking the medicine. So amazing, amazing. Well, work. it's an interesting that you've put together this list of books. Every single one of them, you know, is part of the story, part of the journey, part of mm -hmm. the, you know, the knowledge that you are a woman and you've got to express everything that you are and not yeah. be repressed and or suppressed and yeah. here you are you have this experience and that's exactly yeah. what you know um ayahuasca gave you yeah exactly it, you know the confirmation Incredible. of that totally I mean that in itself it's just it's a life changing they say you know um the wonderful people who are facilitating the ceremony they said there's life before ayahuasca and there's you before ayahuasca and then there's life after and it's just something that's misunderstood you know it's still misunderstood it's not yeah it's a medicine it's a deeply deeply healing medicine and and it will call you and if you are if you're ready you know she'll push you but only as far 
even in the, the lowest point when I was in terrible pain and you feel like you're dying at so you know at points in the ceremony but she I felt safe I still felt yeah. safe I felt very strong it brings out if you don't panic and you're aware and you prepare for the ceremony properly with the the diet beforehand and uh, you come into it with great respect for the medicine and honor for that um you know you you don't panic because uh, it can be easy to panic at the, at the time but um if you don't and you surrender then it's she will yeah. take you on a journey like no other it is literally like hundreds of years i feel worth of stuff has just been released so that's amazing yeah, amazing. Well, thank you for sharing that, Nicola. We yes, don't definitely. have a lot of time left, but um, what, what are you reading now? I've actually got it with me because I thought you would ask, and it arrived yesterday. It's called Between the Lines, Healing the Individual and Ancestral Soul with Family Constellation by Nikki, ah. Nikki McKay. Mm. Yeah. Mm. So, again, tying in. <clears throat> it arrived yesterday. Um, so, again, it's tying in with the work, um, you know, yeah, carrying on from uh, what I've just and interesting done, that all of this has culminated in in this particular event tonight, which we've had booked for months. But the this timing is really of it is perfect. Strange. The time, yeah. but because when you sent me through the dates, and I chose the last one, which was a couple of months, and at the time I was quite busy with other things, and I thought, okay, I'll do it for then. And I was flicking between the 21st or the 28th and something was saying 28th. And the 21st was when I, you know, I uh, did my ayahuasca ceremony and yeah. how it just falls into place that, you know, going over these books now and really talking about them and looking at them, it, doing it from where I am now, I'm still not grounded. You know, I'm still, the med it takes a good couple of weeks after you've drunk the medicine yeah. to, to be grounded again. But it's incredible to look at, oh, you know, and the love actually that you feel, it's, again, it's that self-love when you remove those layers of trauma and all that stuff on top. But when I look back and I think of, you know, myself at 14 reading, You Can Heal Your Life, yeah. I feel really um, proud of, you know, myself for listening to the calling and, and taking it on and even when it's hard. Um, you know, I knew when I had the, the ayahuasca a week ago, I felt nervous because I knew as soon as I drank, I just knew I was going to be in for a night. I just had that feeling of there's a lot of stuff in that's ready to be released. Yeah. Um, and it's yeah. not for everyone, but I feel for me, it is my purpose to do this dark, deep, shadow, healing stuff for the good of not just myself, but the world. When we, when we do that, it's, it has that ripple effect. Yeah, so, it does indeed. Yeah. Wow, what a story. Yeah. Well, Nicola, thank you so much for joining oh, thank us. You thank you so for much. sharing about your experience with um, mm -hmm. ayahuasca, something I haven't done. I'm still mm -hmm. waiting for the call. Yeah, um, if it's supposed but to I'm be fascinated, <laughs> fascinated by people's stories. And I love the way that it's really brought, you know, everything, your journey mm -hmm. all together. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, good. Well, yeah. if anybody wants to check um, check up on Nicola, you can go to her website, Nicola Harold, H A R R O L D dot com, and you can find out more about what Nicola does. Are your meditations there? Um, yeah, there'll be links to the meditations. They're also on Audible, um, but yeah, on the website, there's information as to where. And actually, if anyone uses the Insight Timer app, uh, the mm -hmm. free meditation app. I've got lots of uh, free, completely free meditations on there. That'll be under the name Aluna Moon, A-L-U-N-A -A Moon. Um, it's they're the meditations I've done with a soul sister of mine, someone I used to work with. Um, yeah, there's the menstrual cycle stuff, the womb, womb meditations, all of that, children's meditations. It's all completely free. So yeah, cool. That's a good Nicola Harold. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I'll be back again at the same time next week with another face-to-face um, -face with. I can't tell you right now who it's going to be because I've completely forgotten. But um, we'll see you next week. Thanks for joining us. Nicola, thank you. Oh, thanks, Bye -bye. Andy. Bye.